This is cost one, rate of speaking. Pass are coming here, pressure coming. We're 1.5 below. Stand by, two dives here, boys. We're looking at 10.5 and 42. Hey team, thanks for joining us for another podcast. If you listened to the last edition, then I'm sure you were following Francois Gabar and his giant old team machine, Massif, in the Fastnet race. In the end, it was a full on match race between them and Shatana all the way to Plymouth. A crazy 45 seconds between them in the end. Gabar just pipped at the post by the new duo of Camas and Codrelier, who wiped another four hours off the race record. It was so exciting. And I can't wait to see a lot more of the old teams. Thank you also for your feedback on Gabar. He really is the real deal. And please keep it coming and also rate the pods on iTunes. It makes a difference. Cows is having a stellar summer. The offshore stars may have left, but everyone here is now watching the Sail GP teams ripping around the Solent at obscene speeds in preparation for the penultimate event here in Cows. And to preview the event, we had a chat with Chris Draper. Chris hails from the Olympic world. He's a 49er medalist and is currently the CEO and onboard wing trimmer of the British Sail GP team. And you'll hear, he's pretty honest about how the circuit works and the challenges of running a team. If you want a glimpse inside the Sail GP world, it's a great listen. But it's not just Sail GP chat. Chris has been in three America's Cup teams in the past two America's Cups. He's been at the sharp end of our sport's foiling revolution. And he gives us a, a very candid look at what it's like fighting for the oldest trophy in world sport. It's a real eye opener. Here is the hour I spent with Chris Draper. You want to fly the boat as high as you dare to go as fast as possible. You completely wholly believe that you're going to win and then when we didn't it was like a ton of bricks you know. As a wing trimmer who really doesn't have an aerobic role I was absolutely rooted. Well Chris a uh, massive thanks for joining me and we're in cows Sail GP is about to kick off there's much hype isn't there not just here on the island but uh, for the event, but also for the home team. I mean, how much are you looking forward to, to racing in front of the British fan? Um, yeah, th thanks very much, Cheryl, for letting me come over. Um, yeah, I mean, massively excited for me personally. Um, obviously, enormously excited for the team that we've built, that I'm really, really proud of and, and love being a part of. Um, and, you know, for me personally, getting to race for Britain again after spending a long time racing for Luna Rossa with, um, with the America's Cup and, and then with um, SoftBank, all of which is, you know, enormous honours and, and, and great to be a part of those teams. But it's just so nice to race for Britain again. Um, it's been since the Olympics, you know, really, since, um, since I got to do that on my, on my last year's Olympic campaigning. So... Is, it's really cool to get to do that again. I mean, it could be an incredible event. I mean, we both know the racetrack right off the green here in Cows is not for the faint-hearted, is it? I mean, there's massive tide, rocks, there's always a load of traffic. As you're approaching the event, you know, are you, are you excited or is there a slight, slight nervousness, slight trepidation? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously the trepidation there and nervousness, but... You know, after sailing the boats in Sydney Harbour when we first started sailing them, I mean, that place was a nightmare sailing them because there's just so much traffic. Um, and it literally was in like our day, day first couple of days, you know. I think it was day four was our first day in Sydney for the team. And um, so the Solent's got quite wide open space, but there's a lot of sandbanks, you know. We draw kind of three and a half, four metres. We need a good bit of water. But there is good bits of space and it's going to be nice to a little bit more like assuming we get some nice breeze a lot more like San Francisco where we can open the boats up do some really good maneuvering you know string together five six tacks string together five jibes and so on and and that you know you just learn so much quicker when you have that space to maneuver the local factor is definitely I mean Joe and I have talked about it quite a bit and with Dylan and Stu obviously and I think 
unfortunately but you know they're also good at it like the winning tides books and things like that you know those guys there's such good data there for people to find out about that I don't think the home advantage is going to be enormous in terms of local knowledge you know the course is we're constrained by 0.7 of a mile of boundary you can't get much leverage off to the sides and but I think the biggest advantage really for us coming into the event if we play it r correctly is is you know that home crowd asset and and as long as we see that as as something to take pride in our performance and and do that well rather than it making us nervous then I think that we could have a really great event and yeah that's what we need to do really we saw didn't we in the, in the last event in New York how quickly things could go wrong you know you claimed the dubious title of being the first team to capsize one of these f50s i mean it happened in a, an instant before racing before before the broadcast and you know even commentating on it it feels it feels tense all the time you know how on the edge does it feel from on the boat I think that it, it's, it's always been hard to get across to people how much these boats are on the edge when we're sailing them. Um, you know, it takes such intense concentration to sail them in steady conditions and then you chuck them in the conditions that we had in New York and especially before that first race. I think, you know, as that day went on in that first day in New York, watching it all back, you know, the day kind of tamed off quite significantly and um, and we always knew I mean, it's like taking, it's like taking a Formula One car and saying, racing them around a car park, you know, it's, it was extreme conditions. And just before we capsized, you know, we'd, we'd had a, a discussion that literally went along the lines of someone's going to not get around the course today and let's look after the boat and take it really steady. And, and as you can imagine, we've, we've spent a lot of time in hindsight talking about it and what we could have done differently and, you know, analysing our performance on the Sunday, and but also, you know, go, it's taking, it's going all the way backwards. You'd like to, okay, so how did we deal with the actual event and when it happened? Um, what could we have done to have changed it? What what did we miss and and so on that caused us to capsize? But also, um, you know, how how did we react to it? You know, how could we have come out better on the sun on the second day? You know, recognise the achievement of the shore team to get the boat back out on the water and the sailing team to help make that happen. But also, how could we have been performed better on the sun on the on the Saturday rather? Because at the end of the day, we we didn't really sail very well on the second day, and I think that was a lot of that was nerves and tiredness after the actual thing happening. So, um, so yeah. how how do you? I mean, what was you know, what was the takeaway from that cap size? How do you avoid that kind of moment? Well, I think what we realised afterwards was that we, we talked about sailing safely, um, but I don't think we really put an actual quantifiable point on what was being safe. You know, it's flying super low, it's backing the rudder differential right off and just trying to reduce the risks of all those things. You know, we come away from all the other events you know even like well you guys are talking about it all the time on the commentary that you know you want to fly the boat as high as you dare to go as fast as possible and so you don't want to do that in New York though <laughs> so you found out very quickly and yeah so I think that that was that was one of the biggest things that we didn't really quantify what safe mode meant and and I think, you know, our capsize was an enormous wake-up call for all the other boats. Was it your first capsize in one of these big boats? Yeah, it was, annoyingly. Yeah, I mean, I, I went up, for me personally, I capsized with Team Korea in Plymouth in that carnage event um, when we first started sailing the AC-45s. Um, and we did have one secret capsize as well in, in Portugal, in Cascais, that we tried to keep quiet and under the radar. But, um, so it did... I had, yeah, I capsized twice in the AC-45s, but that was, yeah, the first time in one of these boats, and yeah, a bit of a shame, but um, it was it was good in hindsight that it happened, and, and we've got it out of the way, and I'm sure it was going to happen to someone else again, you know, so many people have come so close and been so lucky not to, um, it was just so irritating that happened on a race day. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the event generally, we're three events in. It's got a, a punchy strap line, hasn't it? You know, sailing redefined. You know, how fresh does it feel? I mean, does it live up to that billing? I think 
you know, seeing it in the Sydney event was awesome, but you know, it was a total unknown. It was, it was day one. Um, the racing was obviously out in the middle of Sydney Harbour, but the amount of spectators that turned up was incredible. Like that was like, wow, this does have some serious weight. Um, and then the San Francisco event, I think, you know, seeing, seeing the photos from the hospitality and the grandstand and things like that of how close the boats were getting to people watching and then the noise that they're making when the six of them coming in and literally jibe, Mark 1 jibe is like 50 metres off the shore and you could, with a good arm on you, you know, you could land your drink in one of the boats. Um, was pretty cool to see, you know, and, and for me as a racer, I think that was the biggest thing is that it's difficult to, from when you're taking part in the racing, it's difficult to assess how it's been perceived by the people watching it. But for me as a racer, you know, I finished those races and as a wing trimmer who really doesn't have an aerobic role, you know, I was absolutely rooted at the end of those races. It's like feeling every minute of 41 years old, you know, like it was, it was insane racing. And, you know, even we had one race in particular that I will never, ever forget where we were um, matching tacks with Japan and jibes all the way for a whole lap, lap and a half. Um, and then they, they actually rolled us coming down the downwind. Um, and then we just tried f to do one less tack than everybody coming into the top mark. And, and it cost us the difference between first or second and we finished fourth in the race. You know, it was gutting that we finished fourth, but for the effort that we, and the race that we'd sailed, but you know, across the finish line, like, oh my God, that was insane racing. Like really, it's so intense and you take every bit of arousal from, you know, a 49 er race or extreme 40 race or something like that, or, or even like the AC 72s and, and like times that by 10 and it, that, you know, you'd start to feel similar to intensity factor. So as, a, as an athlete, it's been really cool. Um, just incredible racing. I mean, that's something coming from you. You sailed these boats in the last America's Cup. I mean, they're not, they're not new to you. Mm. And we'll get to that a little, a little bit later. But I guess I'm wondering, you know, when you left Bermuda, you must have thought, oh, well, that's, that's that then. We won't sail these boats again. I mean, what did you think when Russell Coates contacted you about, about this whole new deal? Um, <laughs> well... I, we, my, we, I was living on a cruising boat with my family, um, so yeah, we, we actually were completely full of food um, and our weather window to go to Panama was literally two days later um, when I got the call from Russell about this and he, he you know, they, they, I, there'd obviously been rumblings and rumours about it and, um, and you know, I'd fin we'd finished the America's Cup in Bermuda and just wanted to decompress for a while, I'd done America's Cup pretty intensely for seven years. You know, we we had a massive disappointment when Luna Rossa folded. Um, we had an incredible team there in Sardinia that, I, you know, a lot of what we had learned, we passed on to Team New Zealand and was really pivotal for Team New Zealand achieving what they did. Um, and, you know, in hindsight, that was really sad that that all fell apart. Team Japan was an incredible experience, but I just wanted to get away from the America's Cup for a while and so we went off and we brought ourselves a cruising boat um, and, and went and did that which was incredible and um, and we, we basically we, we were setting off to go and cross the Pacific and, and Russell called about the British team and he, there'd been some discussions and rumblings about some of the other teams but I was um, really keen if the opportunity was there to do the British team. Um, but I didn't, wasn't sure whether I'd get the, get the chance or not. And then when it did come along, it was like, ooh, it's a pretty big decision to make. And obviously the family and, and all of us, it was a full family decision. Um, so we, we, we gave up our weather window and we sailed to Grenada, which was where everybody sits in the hurricane season and, um, and decided to think about putting the boat up for sale. Um, or go and think about it more and then after a couple of weeks we decided to put the boat off for sale and and that was that and then and then um, yeah then we started building then started building the team from there onwards and 
yeah, it's been incredible and amazing to build the team from from nothing, you know, starting at, at, square, at, at absolutely, you know, the idea of the, the few people that were capable of driving the boats and, um, and, and go from there was, yeah, amazing opportunity. Yeah, and how fantastic, I guess, to be in charge of it all, to, you know, to be making all the decisions, especially when you've come from the, from the America's Cup world. I mean, let's, let's talk generally a little bit about your team and, and the whole setup. I mean, you're the CEO, Dylan Fletcher is driving. You know, just explain perhaps how your team, the British team, operates and works. Uh, yeah, so Dylan is the skipper, um, so obviously as soon as we're on the boat, on the water, the boat is his responsibility, you know. Um, it's probably been a bit tricky for him and, and I, you know, in the, the early stages of him getting to know the boat and being able to give him those reins, but um, he's all o absolutely all over it now um, and been incredibly mature about the way he's learned to manage a boat alone with a steering wheel you know but just you know the wing all the people it takes an enormous amount of orchestration and and you know communication skills to get the boat in and out of the dock and just to start with and he's he's really embraced that and done an incredible job there which has been brilliant to watch um and then Stu Bithell his um his right hand man in the 49er who you know incredible feel and yeah, an amazing sailor and, and person to be around and have part of the, as part of the team. Um, he, Stu takes on the flight controller role. In Sydney, he did more of the kind of tactics and strategy when Dylan was still flying the boat. Um, but when we went to San Francisco with, you know, the plan to have the flight controller flying the boat, that was what we wanted to do. Um, and we'd always seen the potential there watching the Kiwis in the America's Cup. And um, so we really wanted to move that way if we could. And it really lent itself so well to the style of the way they sail the 49er. Um, so that was something we were really keen to do. Then we've had, um, we've had a couple of uh, guys working with us from Ineos, which has been fantastic, um, with Nick Hutton and, um, and Neil Hunter. Um, those guys, Nick was with us for, um, for the first two events. And he, you know, he brought a, a wealth of experience of effectively being the flight controller for most of the teams the way that they were set up in Bermuda other than the Kiwis were that, that there was someone flying the boat out of the tax and jibes and Nick was that person for, um, for Ineos so, or BAR at that time so he, um, he had a lot of experience there to share um, that he helped Stu with in the early days of, of flying the boat in and out of the manoeuvres um, and you know, obviously enormous experience of these boats and working in these teams and, and handling these boats. So he, he brought a massive amount to our group early on. And then um, and Neil as well, you know, he's kind of, you know, the, the model athlete really for this kind of sailing. You know, he's gone from Olympic sailing to very quickly moving into the Youth America's Cup to getting pulled onto the race yacht for the actual America's Cup to you know being one of the best grinders in the world so he he's been great to have and he's we've managed to keep him the whole season you know Ineos have been enormously supportive um to let him be able to do that with us but um unfortunately we're going to lose him at the end of the year and then um and then Richard Mason who you know I've known Rich since um coaching him in Oppies um and you know I went to the Oppie Worlds coaching him actually and and um and seen his career you know go really take off and he it's so experienced you know and he's been enormously diverse but has always been sailing the highest level boats as well foiling and and so on so he he was a really obvious choice and um and he was also very good friends with Dylan as well so it kind of um fitted really nicely um and then Matt Gottrell as well who you know my experience with Team Japan and and bringing, like, we brought Yuki Kasatani, who's with Sail, uh, the J Japanese Sail GP team, um, into the team, um, and he was a rower, and, and, and he became an incredible grinder and, and is fantastic now, and, and then we had the opportunity for someone like Shrek, who, Matt, Gottrell. Matt Gottrell, sorry, who had done some, some really high-level Olympic sailing as well, 
um, but also gone and won a gold in rowing and, and he was a really obvious choice. Um, yeah, he's been fantastic and brings a lot of that work ethic of the rowers and the training regime and so on to it as well. So um, yeah, those guys have been incredible to have. Let's talk a bit about Dylan Fletcher. I mean, he, he was plucked really from the refined world of Olympic 49er sailing. But without a, without a quiver of Olympic medals on his CV, but he has quickly earned his stripes, hasn't he? I mean, you know, he's, he's, his strap line, I guess, is, you know, the fastest learner in sail GP. I mean, to me, he also seems, he seems like a whole different person from that shy, slightly awkward man at the launch of the series back in, back in London in October. What kind of, of competitor is he? You know, what, what's his main attributes? And I guess, what did, what did both you and Russell Coots see in him that convinced you he was, he was right for the job? Well, I think in Russell's words, Russell saw a lot of himself in him. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I first met Dylan sailing with Simon, you know, when we were both Olympic, camp, when we were all Olympic campaigning and, um, and we'd be doing lots of training racing and we used to do lots of obviously really, really short course races. And there was this young, really young guy that had just come out of the 29ers. And he's just constantly questioning, you know, like, Jesus, this guy won't, just won't go away. Like, it's just asking so many questions. You know, then we learned that he, he'd only started sailing when he was kind of like 14 or 15 or something like that. And, and, and at that point, you know, he was only like 20. So he, he hadn't been sailing that long at all. Um, and he was sailing with a chap called Alan Sign, who was, you know, Alan was incredibly talented as well. And, you know, they had a, a really successful 49er campaign um, together. In, and, um, but, you know, we're really disappointed not to win a medal in Rio. And, uh, you know, we're very, very close, really. It was just one jive in the medal race and, and that was it. So, you know, I think you say that Dylan hasn't had that Olympic, hasn't got an Olympic medal, but I, I'm confident he will have um, very soon. And, you know, when Dylan, there was, there was obviously quite a few people on uh, uh, there as the options for who, who could be capable of driving these boats. And um, you really have to look back at history of people that have jumped on these kind of boats and look at what, what kind of level of sailing they've been at, what, what disciplines and style of racing they've done. Um, you know, the Nathan Outridges, Pete Burling, you know, it's easy to compare those guys and, and from Great Britain, you know, the best example is Dylan. It must bring back memories of, of your own Olympic story, Chris. It was a little bit different in that when I stopped Olympic sailing, you know, I was actually pretty fed up with the sport for a while and, and I, I, planned to, I planned to stop, to be honest. Um, you know, Simon and I went to, went to Athens and, and didn't achieve what we hoped to achieve. You know, in hindsight, we should have enjoyed and, and celebrated and loved every moment of our ex experience at the Olympics. And unfortunately, it's one kind of major regret that I have in the sport. But we um, fought, worked so hard to try and um, make amends straight after Athens um, that we, you know, we got to the end of 2006 and we're, you know, we've been number one in the world for a long time. And we'd won the Worlds, we'd won the pre-Olympics, you know, we we, you know, we were in great shape and, but we just, we just, don't know, just burnt out. And, and then it came to 2007 and, and Stevie and Ben were just chomping at the bit and hungry as, as anything and, and, and absolutely demolished the worlds in, in Qashqai and, and suddenly that was it. And the, we'd lost, we hadn't, we weren't even going to qualify for Beijing. Um, so it was, a, and yeah, it was, at that point I was, I kind of wasn't that fussed about going sailing for quite a while. So, and then then I found the extreme sailing series and and um, and some yeah my closest friends encouraged us to go and do it again um, with Bulkers and and Pete and and Freddie. We'll get to the extremes in a, in a second, but you know we were obviously in the same team yeah. at Athens, and I have a really clear memory of you there. I mean it was. It was more than disappointment. It was almost like heartbreak. And I remember we, we didn't know, not knowing what to say or what to do, which is common, yeah. isn't it? Because you know that it has meant 
that it has meant so much. Yeah. I mean, that properly, it properly felt like it hit you hard. Yeah, it did. It did. It was, it was interesting because I think, you know, I did a lot of stuff on the sport. Sorry, but yeah, but I've never really thought, talked <laughs> thought about Athens that much. But um, yeah, I think we, we did a lot of stuff on the sports psychology side and the build up and, and from 2000 onwards, really, um, that I think was, was, was massively powerful. But at the same time, you know, it really made you so one track minded in that you, you completely wholly believed that you were going to win and, and there was no uncertain terms about it. And then, and then when we didn't, it was like just a ton of bricks, you know, it didn't know what to do with ourselves. And, um, you know, and also I guess in some ways I felt bad for Simon because he, he, you know, we, in many ways we threw away our silver, you know, we were guaranteed a medal and, and all we had to do was beat Roddy and beat that, that guy by a certain amount of points, you know, and we got a silver and, but we still had that belief that we could win gold. So we went out and tried to sail a risky race and, 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 and then ended up with bronze. And, but, you know, it still was an incredible achievement. And the Olympic campaign that Simon and I put together was, was, was awesome, you know. And um, I guess it was just, yeah, we just worked so hard on that belief that we were going to win that when we didn't, it, and it's, it's really sad now in, in hindsight to think back about my Olympic memories. It's, it's a shame, but... I guess that was just the way we felt at the time and, and, and part of that is why we had the success that we did have through through our, our years together. So um, I guess you shouldn't, I shouldn't think about it with um, remorse, but yeah, it was, it was a tough one at the time. What advice would you give Dylan and Stu, I guess, going for the, going for the next Olympics? I, yeah, I think for me, I think one of the biggest things for me, and I mean, you've obviously done a bunch of them, so you, you, well, and I think the Olympics is one of Simon and I's biggest things that we try to do is try and treat every event like it was the same um, and never kind of put a, a specific race even on a pedestal. Um, you know, the final race of the Olympics, we tried to treat the same as the first race of qualifying, but I think the reality is, is that the enormity of the Olympics is so huge that it is impossible to treat it like another event. And, and with hindsight, you know, that was a real mistake that we made. Um, just went there trying to keep heads down and almost bury your head and not enjoy the Olympic occasion um, and not get every bit out of it and, and really embrace it. And I think, I think if you go there with that attitude, um, I think it can be a really fun, experience while you're having success and I think we just didn't quite get the balance right there so I think that would be the biggest thing um, but you know Stu I think for those guys as well they'd be going to their second Olympics both of them um, so I, I you know they're they're so measured these days the Olympic campaigners they're so refined in all of the classes um, so well prepared from all the support networks to all of the people that are coaching them that have experienced the games and you know people like Ian running the team and and so on so we're not running the team but running the RA and then Mark running the team um they you know they're they're so much better prepared than we ever were um and I think that they've got all those skills there that for, for people like me to try and give them advice this is just like a waste of time to be honest um so yeah I, I, but I think the biggest thing is just to enjoy the Olympic experience well, you mentioned the extreme 40s. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, it really was, it was the birth of fast cat racing, stadium racing, inner city sailing. Um, and it felt like a huge leap and we were lucky enough mm. to be involved right at the very beginning. It was so exciting yeah. to be a part of it. It felt so fresh and it felt, to me anyway, it felt we were right at the beginning of something really special. What are your memories of those early years? Um, yeah, some really different memories. Um, it was an amazing opportunity that I don't think any of us realised quite how lucky we were at the time. And, you know, have some such funny memories of some of the racing. Um, I remember the first event in Lugano, 
I mean, I'm sure you can, oh, well, you won. We won it. You absolutely <laughs> smashed it. I, I saw Maniac the other day, actually, and we were talking about that event the other day. And um, Chris May, my tactician. Yeah. And um, I know, I, I'll never, ever forget that gust that came through and, um, and wiped out a lingy. And I remember we were going down, we were heading towards the wall. I'm like, oh my God, how did we round up? <laughs> like, just no idea how to turn the boat up. Um, and we had a similar one with Dylan, actually, in the M32s the other week when we were doing a round the island race in Newport. But um, yeah, so that, that, that was a really, a really fond memory. Um, and then I remember another one in, um, in Amsterdam in, I don't know, I can't, I don't think it, it was the last event of the year that in that first year. It was when Alinghi kept starting like 40 seconds behind everybody. They'd worked out that then you got the puff that pulled you through and you got to the lead at the bottom. It was ridiculous racing, but I remember we were winning a race and we got this huge backing shift and shifting puff and it just put us in irons in the middle of the river, like completely stopped. <laughs> and we were literally like eight minutes behind and we were getting, and there were so many people watching and we just got like a slow clap as we, <laughs> as we sailed to the finish line. And I'll never forget like how, <laughs> how tail between the legs we felt and um, just laughing at ourselves on the boat. But um, one year in Amsterdam, um, I think it was the first the first year I did it. I mean, it was a it was a sort of slightly wide canal yeah. to explain it with massive big buildings on either side. So the wind just arrived from nowhere, didn't it? From the heaven. Yeah. We capsized on the grandstand, so our entire rig <laughs> was on the grandstand. And uh, Nick Hutton, who you mentioned earlier, he's now with Ineos. He, uh, he just walked up the boat and the boat came upright. And again, we got massive, massive <laughs> rounds of applause. It was funny moments. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that play, I remember another one where we were like 10 boats wide coming into the bottom gate and nobody could round up because it was only 11 boats wide or something. But yeah, so, such funny days, those events. And, and then, like we touched on earlier, um, the event here in Cowes, we, we had an incredible event, you know. We, I can't remember. I remember we had one day where we got six first and a second or something like that. Like we just had an absolutely dream event, and um, yeah, that and that was another a really fond memory as well from the extremes. It was, it was yeah, blooming good days and and the start of this kind of racing and this kind of format, and um, and we were just really lucky to be a part of that in those early days. I don't know about you, but it, for me, it certainly felt like it was right on the edge. I mean, looking back, we we'd no helmets. There was very little safety kit. There was no little bottles of oxygen yeah. and knives and, and tramp cutters. There was none of all that. We just all assumed, I guess, that it would be all right. Yeah, and we sailed them four up. <laughs> four up. I remember you had to manoeuvre the guest around to where you were sat when you wanted to bear away to get them right on the back. Like, yeah, it was, yeah, it was full on. It's come a long way, yeah. I guess. Yeah, definitely. The belief that you could actually do it in a boat that big was a bit of an unknown. You just pin it off at a certain rake and you knew that if you went over a certain boat speed you were just going to have the biggest crash going. Earlier in this podcast series we spoke to Nathan Eitridge and he talked about his transition to the world of the America's Cup. You know, a gold medal in the London Games, they were all ringing him up. I mean, he couldn't believe it. He hardly knew who those people were. And uh, I suppose I always think that's a really fascinating leap, isn't it? You know, getting into, getting that big break into the cut world. For you though, I guess it was partly the extreme 40s. I mean, it was an amazing launch pad into a whole new era of the cup. Great exposure for you, spotted by Prada, you know, one of the biggest teams in the cup with with huge expectations you know looking back you know how did that happen and what did it feel like to be you know sitting in the base in Cagliari in your in your Prada gear <laughs> um yeah the Prada clothes um but that wasn't quite my bag to be honest but yeah it was a nice gear um I think I, I, in, in many ways um, you know, and, and in, in talks about the America's Cup and so on, you know, I've often said that I felt so fortunate with timing, um, with how things went when it moved, you know, I, I, I got the opportunity, main, you know, partly through 
through Bart and um, and Ian. Um, and, person, yeah, and, and and obviously through um, through Ben Ainsley as well to go and do um, an event with Team Origin down in New Zealand um, when we were getting ready for the two thousand and nine season with the Americas uh, with the Extreme Sailing Series, and it was just my first little dip of the toe and I thought, wow, I'd actually really like to get involved in this. Um, and then shortly afterwards, we went back to Oman to get ready for the Extreme Sailing Series and. And then we watched Oracle win the cup, um, all sat together in, in Oman um, and realised that that probably meant it was going to go into catamarans. Um, so it was like, wow. Um, so we, I, you know, I, I got in, well, I didn't, I guess through circumstance, you know, and as the season went on, we were doing well and, and uh, a few teams came and did some events, you know, we Oracle obviously started the circuit and um, so we got chatting to some of those guys and, and, and then Artemis were getting some extreme 40s and, and, and so on and, and yeah and then I did some coaching for Prada as well because they started doing the extreme 40s the following season and I actually stopped in 2010 to um, go back and have another little go at the 49er and, and during that time you know I decided I, you know, there were some potential opportunities there with the cup, but I said to all those people, I, I'm going to go and have a go for London um, in the 49er with Peter Greenhouse. And, and we went and gave that a nudge and, and had some really good success. We won the Europeans and we're, we're going well, but as per usual, you know, there's a super deep 49er fleet. Um, but then we had, we had a, a rubbish sail for gold regatta which was the start of the trials and at about that same time i got the opportunity to do some to do something i got offered a role with team korea um which team korea in hindsight for you know three of us was like an absolute career launch pad um so i sat down with peter and talked about it and you know there was a bit of uncertainty whether i believe that we could have gone to london and and, and won a medal but there was this opportunity that I wasn't sure I could ignore. And so in, to cut a long story short, I went and got the chance with Team Career and it went really well. And, and I'd done the coaching with Prada earlier in the year and Max had called me not long ago to see what where I was at and what my thoughts were. And Max Serena, Max, Lina Rossa. Yeah, so yeah, we came out of a, an event and I realized that it really wasn't gonna happen. So I gave Max a call and, and um, and two months later, I was off to New Zealand with the family and, and um, started at, at Luna Rossa. And, and the next thing I knew, we'd got a boat to sail. And, um, and Bruni was my wing trimmer and tactician, which was an amazing opportunity. And, and yeah, we, um, and we went from there and that, that led me down the America's Cup. Something, Chris, that, that always fascinates me about the Cup is you know, as the racing approaches and you've been all, you know, heads down, day and night, behind a closed shed door, doing, you know, all you can to get to the start line in good shape. And particularly in that cup, the 34th America's Cup in San Francisco, the Kiwis launched their AC-72 and it flew across the bay. I mean, they made their massive machine foil. That must have been, you know, some moment of realization you know, what was what was that like inside you knew what was coming we kind of knew what was coming <laughs> but the belief that you could actually do it in a boat that big was obviously a bit of an unknown um just the the loads you know the prediction tools back then were very much in their infancy and and um and just you know i mean even people like Juan k didn't think you could do it you know like absolute legends of the sport so and and whether it was faster and the performance was better and, and whether Carrick dragging that thing up wind, which we were thinking at the time, lo and behold, that was really quite silly, um, that it was better BMG around the course. So, yeah, I mean, that was an amazing time then for as a sailor because, you know, we had all these different shapes and sizes of foils, you know, just and they all had nicknames and you know, comedy nicknames and that... Like what? 
they, they had the Kiwis had one that they called the Drysdale, which was the guy that had beat one of their team members to um, Olympic selection in the rowing or something like just brutal. Um, and yeah, we had one foil that was called the Draper, and there was another one called the CJ. And they were they were ironically one was kind of quite stable and forgiving and very sort of you know risk averse like myself and then the cj was very fast but high risk and, and it would crash at any moment um so yeah it was, i should probably name check paul campbell james <laughs> yeah. at this point if he's listening yeah so i mean and we had no rate control on those things you know we just we had we could move well we could move them but not while we we're on the fly so you know, you just pin it off at a certain rake and you knew that if you went over a certain boat speed, you were just going to have the biggest crash going. So it was amazingly fun days, those early days, trying to learn and make these boats foil. Um, it was, yeah, a lot of fun. We felt like bobsleigh teams, you know, just strapping in and off you go, just bear away, see what happens. It was, it was blooming good fun. But yeah, the, the first day that we saw the Kiwi boat foiling, it was like, wow, this is actually on. How, how are you going to? maneuver it and then it was probably I reckon it was only about 12 or 14 days later that we saw what we thought was a foiling jibe and um, I mean they learned to do it so quickly it's unbelievable. So out of the Challenger series of the AC34 I guess you knew it was it was maybe coming um, and you started the next America's Cup cycle um, for Bermuda back with Luna Rossa I mean it, it was all about foiling, wasn't it? It was about going fast, it was smaller boats. You must have really felt, Chris, like, yeah, this is, this is my time. I'm, I'm in the right place at the right time. But it, it wasn't to last. Just perhaps, you know, explain what happened to that campaign. Um, because, of course, Luna Rossa weren't in Bermuda. Yeah. Well, Luna Rossa for, for San Francisco was like very much a last, wasn't a last ditch attempt. It was a predecessor to the next campaign it, the whole idea was it was going to be okay we're going to do this campaign to prep the team ready for the next campaign um so you know from my point of view and, and a lot of, for all of us you know it was an enormous opportunity but we knew we got generation one of the of the kiwi boat um they launched a, a next generation boat after that um and it was, but we we knew that was the case, and it was about doing the best with what we had and being ready to hot foot it into the next cycle as quick as we could with what was going to be the AC sixty two for that next campaign. So, I mean, what the cup finished in September, and by January I was moving to Cagliari in Sardinia um, to start with Luna Rossa, and by you know, April, we were 110 strong and, you know, working seriously, seriously hard, like full, full time. 110 people flat out. It was like all guns blazing, new, massive new base in Sardinia and incredible design team, you know, like Marsh, all, Marshalino Botin, all those guys, then Mario Caponetto and all those guys that had come from Oracle, you know, the Martin Fishers of the world. And... We were quite slow. They were, we were quite slow with our foil development, but obviously we'd all realised from the previous cup that it was about foiling upwind and it was going to be about tacking on the foils and and um, and keeping the boat foiling for the whole race course. And and one of the things that we were working really hard on was we realised that you, the with the with the hydrofoils the it pretty much correlates to the harder you make them to use, the faster they go. Um, so you're flying them actively as a human it's not like there's a plane guiding your flight um so the control system can't be too good and in effect effectively but what we also realized was there was kind of a bit of a loophole in the rule in that you could effectively have an algorithm like on a fighter jet where you know when the when the pilot of a fighter jet pulls the joystick back it's not like they're determining the exact flap angle or aileron angles and things like that it's it's um it's a computer that's doing that and it's just interpreting their joystick movement um and there was an obvious loophole there in the rules that could be exploited and i remember our last day of sailing with luna rossa was the first day that the autopilot beat the human um 
so we were two boating all the time, myself against Bruni, and um, and we had m enough members in the sailing team, really great bunch of people, you know. Um, and it was the first day that the computer smashed the human. Um, and we started to bear away and round up on the computer. It's like, oh my gosh, like this is enormous. Um, the, the goal, the, the, the hurdle was then obviously going to be making the human link and, and make it fit in the rules. But that, um, and, and, and then very shortly after that, that day, in fact, that was our last day of sailing. Um, and then we went and did a team building um, trip in the Alps um, and sat down the second morning of that to have breakfast with Max and he said, they want to do it in 45s. Like, what do you mean? Because like, we were challenger of record, I didn't think that could ha anything like that could happen. I thought it, was a, you know, it had to be an unanimous vote. And, um, and I, I thought he was, it was a wind up, you know. Um, and kind of like shrugged it off and so we did that team building event and then we actually had a 10 day holiday um, and then we got back to Sardinia and I'd actually gone for a surf um, because we'd been given the afternoon a, a break in the afternoon and just got in from a really really good surf actually <laughs> it was absolutely fizzing after it and um, to a call from P from PG Pierluigi De Felici who's with the team um, and he's like, you need to get here fast. Um, people are crying. There's like, it's all going off. Nobody knows what's happening. And, um, and yeah, sure enough, it, it, they'd made that decision to, to go with the AC, well, what became the AC 50 at that point, it was going to be an AC 45. And, um, you know, we'd invested 25 million into the build of an AC 62 and, and Patrizio was fed up and, and in many ways, understandably, obviously really disappointingly for us that we're all part of that team, he, he decided that, that was, he was fed up and that he didn't want anything to do with it. So, yeah, so that decision was made, um, yeah, which was really sad. Was, there was a lot of people, Luna Ross is kind of, for anybody that's been involved in it, you know, it's, it's very much a family and yeah, so it was, it was sad. Yeah, it was tough. Tough times, but Chris, your stock was high and you did end up in Bermuda this time with SoftBank Team Japan and with Dean Barker fronting that. I mean, how much of a relief, I guess, was it that, that you got that call? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was obviously, you know, as, as you can imagine, all, all of us tried to, I mean, we tried to cling on to the hope that Luna Rossa might rethink um, their decision but Patrizio is not the kind of person that makes decisions lightly and if he if he's made a decision that's it you know and and, and in the back of my mind that was kind of the case and, and, and I actually went into Max you know uh, about three or four days later I'm like we've done so much work you know we've been sailing 45s for a year you know we're, we're crushing this campaign and but he he was like he you can't we can't disrespect Patrizio's decision so so I started I, I got in touch with you know obviously the other teams knew that this was the case and 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 obviously all the other teams knew there was going to be people coming out of Luna Rossa that had been working hard for the you know the, the previous cycle and, and this one so and had learned a lot so yeah there was there was a there was quite a few opportunities there and Dean I'd got to know through our time with Luna Rossa in New Zealand and and I really liked the opportunity that was there and it was you know to, by going I got the opportunity to sail on the boat um, to go with SoftBank and, and that was a big draw and um, and yeah and it was an incredible and, and also obviously to go and sail with Dina and the team that he was building and, and yeah it was a great opportunity and, and an incredible time. Bermuda was an amazing place to go and live as well for a few years. I know you mentioned Dean earlier on, but he's, of course, leading the team, but he was also the losing helm in the San Francisco Cup. I mean, he lost nine races on the bounce mm. to the Americans. I mean, you could have forgiven him, couldn't you, for never getting involved again. Did you ever talk to Dean about, about all of that in that time? Yeah, not, not really. Um, I mean, it was... It was kind of almost a not discussed subject. You know, there was, 
there was a good depth of that team had been had come from Team New Zealand and and, and that campaign, um, and it was you know we, we we all saw how how tough that was and the emotion of that happening. I, you know you watch back the footage and I remember watching back the footage of it just after. I, well, actually, when I was making during my decision making about whether to go with Team Japan and, and seeing how brutal that was, um, was, yeah, just in, immense. But their their ability to bounce back and, you know, the Kiwi's self-belief and, you know, Dean's especially and, and all his guys around him, you know, they, they are just in, incredibly strong athletes and, and performers and, and watching how they conducted themselves after that and, you know, you've only got to look at Team New Zealand and how they conducted themselves, but also Dean and all the people that were with Team Japan, you know, they gave everything they had up until the absolute last possible minute. And it was it was really impressive to see. And I think, you know, Dean had a tricky role where he was running the team and, and driving the boat. Um, and I think it's, it's great to see him now getting the opportunity just to focus again, just on driving and um, and all that weight of pressure be lifted and, with American Magic, I think those guys are putting together a really great campaign with a really great group around them again. And um, yeah, it's, it's not, I, I've seen him quite a bit over the last sort of six months and he looks very relaxed and like there's a lot of weight being lifted off his shoulders, not having to run the team, but just focus on driving. But yeah, a great honor to sail with, you know, one of the greats of our sport. I mean, each, each America's Cup is memorable for, it, for its own reasons. That's what's so special about it. But for me, Bermuda, those boats firing around the great sound. I mean, it was, it was incredible to be there as part of the broadcast. But what was, you know, what was that like when you look back to, to Bermuda? What, what, one of the super cool things was, you know, the development in handling and, um, and people's ability to, to sail the boats. Like... You think back to, we did a foiling tack, um, I don't know, it must have been, it was about October before we, oh no, it was, it was May or June. So it was basically a year before the cup. We, and, and you know, it was an absolute jack in the most perfect conditions of something that we believed could be possible. And kind of, we were learning what seemed to be good as we were going through it. And then we did one and we did it right in front of Oracle and, and that was in perfect conditions, you know, like 19, 18, 19 knots, low drag, tiny little daggerboard tips. And um, I mean, obviously we, we, we later very quickly found out that the Kiwis were doing them almost at exactly the same time as us in New Zealand. Um, but that massively governed a lot of the design decisions that were made, the size of the daggerboard tips and so on and, and the way we went about making the boats work and so on. So yeah, it was just amazing to see the speed of learning up to two weeks or three weeks before the cup, like some of the, the racing and the level that the racing was getting, was getting to, to the point where, you know, if you were leading, it was very hard to throw away a lead. Um, although we did manage to throw away a lot during the actual America's cup, but um, that's a different story. But um, I think, yeah, it was incredible to see the level that people got sailing the boats um and you know some of the, all those days when we, obviously we were there for a long time with artemis and oracle and um and we had some amazing racing with those those two teams just the three boat t taking turns to race each other and stuff like that just epic epic racing and the, and seeing the level rise and rise and rise um if, i mean if i was to look, for me personally if i look back on my america's cup sailing then nearly always could have thought what broader and wider as to what could be achieved with the boats you know in hindsight our boat that we had in, in with prada in in san francisco even you know if we'd have cantered those foils out they'd have been epic for foiling up wind you know but we just didn't push the envelope and and um and what team new zealand did you know for was just amazing like they just push the envelope so hard it's unbelievable literally every area they exploited way way harder pushed 
pushed every element harder than any other team and it was and to do that on their own not there when all the other teams were training together was yeah just incredible I remember Chris every time I met you in the, in the lead up to Bermuda you didn't talk about the cup you talked about um your year afterwards you're you're going cruising with H and and the kids and I know you mentioned it earlier in the podcast but I'm I'm really keen to know I guess what the what the reality of, of taking a year out on a boat with a young family is. And I, and I know there's plenty sailing enthusiasts will have toyed with the idea, but what does it, you know, what does it actually look like? Um, yeah, it was, well, H is um, my wife, her family have lived on their boat, or her mum and dad have lived on their boat ever since we got married. Um, so 12 years ago, nearly 13 years ago, they moved on to their cruising boat. Um, and and they've been loving every minute of it ever since and and h did a lot of cruising with with them when she was tiny too and it's something that i'd always fancied and you know you do the america's cup and you know when you're olympic sailing you think it's hard work but i mean it's not um you do the america's cup you know it's like 60 70 hour weeks and it's just relentless non-stop and it was long and 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 by the end of it i really wanted to just spend some time with my kids that were just growing up so fast and I was just missing every minute of it and spend some time with H and and just get to enjoy some really nice time together we just hadn't had it um so we and and to be honest I, I was finding the cup life quite hard and um and and we we decided that we needed to give ourselves something to work towards afterwards um to really push through and do the best we could um, for, for, for the team and, and, and for myself and, and for the family, really. Um, I decided, found a boat. Actually, Paul Campbell James found this boat that we went, ended up, that I ended up going to look at and, and been really looking online at lots of different boats. And, and then this one turned up in the British Virgin Islands. It's like, oh, it's a bit smaller than we've been thinking, but it was really good shape. And, so anyhow, I went there to look at it and turned up with like five surfboards under my arms and two or three bags to which the broker took one look and he's like, oh my God, I've got one here. Like it wasn't as though I was going to be turning around. But um, it, it was a really, a, a really sort of cool experience. We, we brought the boat from a lovely, lovely couple. Um, so we moved on the boat. We took we sold lots of stuff in Bermuda, um, like our furniture and things like that that we bought in Bermuda and, and, um, and, and moved to the boat with, with, I'd taken all those surfboards and then we went there with three bags to, and, and, and the family and we got there at like 2 a.m. I think in the end with these bags and some really knackered kids and, um, and, and got onto the boat and spent our first night on the boat. And I mean, we got on the boat and literally within about four or five, well, two or three days, I realized that I knew absolutely nothing about boats. Having spent my whole life being a sailor, supposedly, I really, the, the, the worst day was the day when I realized I didn't know how to service a winch, having been a wing trimmer for like, the, the shore team at Team Japan, shocked and appalled. But we learned to deal with the boat and learned to homeschool that was one of the biggest challenges um the early bit was kind of like a honeymoon um of being on the boat like being on holiday and then we had probably two or three weeks of cabin fever of me and h multiple times sell the boat this is a ridiculous idea what we're doing um and then and then that was when it got really amazing after then um and we had some you know some amazing times in st bart's um and then we sailed on to Antigua, and that was when we really started to have, we really started to love the cruise, and we met some really nice people that were locals in Antigua. Um, and then there were people like Shannon Falcone, who I'd worked with with Prada, his family, and Louis Sinclair from Oracle, and lots of and his family, and, and loads of people that were super welcoming. And we met some lovely local families as well. And then we went through Hurricane Irma, and we thought we were going to totally lose the boat. Um, we put it on the hard and 
it was all insured, but the insurance company wouldn't guarantee it. And, and then he had, cut a long story short, then we got away with Hurricane Irma um, and sailed down to Grenada as quick as we could get out of the hurricane belt. And, and that was when we first started to meet other crews and families and, and made some amazing friends. It was, yeah, really, really cool. Um, yeah, an amazing experience. H kept a, a pretty detailed blog. We all, you know, everyone who knew you fo followed it. And whenever she sent a picture, it was generally of you and the kids surfing. I mean, <laughs> yeah. did you pick where you, where you went to um, based on, on the condition of the surf? I mean, how big a deal is surfing for you, Chris? Yeah, yeah, it's massive for me. Yeah, and, and it's becoming pretty big for, for my kids. Well, certainly for Harry. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, that was one of the reasons why we wanted to do it was just to go and spend lots of fun time in the water doing all the stuff we love doing so you know some of my fondest memories will be you know like trying to kite surfing with the kids in between my legs on the board when they're really tiny and and um and surfing big boards with them on the front and all of us together and with h surfing in the lineup as well and those times were, were brilliant, you know, and that was, yeah, memories forever. For our listeners, and you'll probably be able to tell from Chris's voice, but he has a massive grin, <laughs> a massive grin on his face. It's definitely, definitely a passion. Um, Chris, we've, we've been talking for a, long, for a long time, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, gone quick. Yeah, yeah, enough, yeah, enough about cruising and enough about Sorry surfing. About let's, just, let's just remind our listeners, really, of... Um, what's coming up at Sail GP. I mean, give us a glimpse, give us the feeling of what these boats are like to sail at full speed. I mean, the images from San Francisco, are, you know, I'll never forget that. What, mm. what does it feel like on board? Um, well, I've done quite a lot of talks recently about it all. And, and one of the biggest analogies that I've been using is, you know, imagine sitting out of your car window, sitting on the outside of your car window outside driving with your hand inside um, at 50 miles an hour and turning as fast as you can um, 90 degrees <laughs> and sitting on the outside of that turn <laughs> and and doing that with water spraying in your face all of the time and and, uh, and then racing other boats while or other cars while you're doing that um, and that kind of gives you some analysis of what it feels like to sail on these boats and then you know, the noise that they make is incredible, the foils whistling and, and six of them careering towards you when you stood on the shore or, or watching from your spectator boat is really is something that it's difficult to get your head around how dramatic it is. And Chris, we just did a, a podcast with French offshore sailor Francois Gabba and he gave a, a lovely analogy, I guess, of, of this period in sailing. I mean, he thinks the sport is in the midst of a, a real revolution. It's it's really exciting time right now, and you're one of the guys at the very cutting edge of all that. You know, where do you look for inspiration? I mean, he was very much having to look out, out with the mm. sport, but where where do you see inspiration in, in this era of, of the sport? It's difficult to put a, a, a I've got a kind of one that hit me a couple of days ago um, that was like, wow, that is really is something that is affecting the sport, uh, uh, affecting water sport um, is what we've been doing. And, you know, we um, I've been trying to learn to kite for the last few weeks. The, the family's been away because for, for, for a few reasons, but and I've been busy with work and I had a few moments when I've been able to kite for in the, every a few hours in the evenings and stuff. And um, I met one of the guys from one of the kite schools down in Poole the other day and he saw my foil and he was like, God, that's a nice foil. And, 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 and one of my friends said, oh, Chris is involved in the America's Cup. And he's like, oh, it's thanks to you guys that we've got these incredible things, you know, and that we learn, we've learned so much about it that these, that's why you're able to get on that thing and go foiling in a couple of days, you know. And it, it, it's, it's mad to think the trickle down, you know, that, you know, so many clubs and around the country now have like foiling Thursdays or foiling Friday and everybody's out on their foils. You know, there's windsurfers, kite surfers, moths, there's 101s, you know, there's foiling ACATs, there's foiling catamaran, anything, you know, they've all got foils on and 
they're building motorboats to get around Lake Geneva. And, you know, it's, it's mad to see the trickle down. You know, yeah, I, I know the traditionalists will always say hydrofoils have always been there, when, and they have, but the understanding of them now um, and what the America's Cup has given back to, to water sports industry is incredible. Um, and it's been really cool to see that. I think, you know, you look at the version five boats and things like that, and yeah, like winches and blocks and all that kind of stuff moved on and sail making processes moved on incredibly. But I think what Team New Zealand did, putting hydrofoils on their AC72, and you know, the trickle down now, eight, 10, nine, nine years later is just absolutely astronomical. What do you think the future holds for the sport? tough question yeah it? it's a tough question you know i think i i i have to say that i think that the new ac75s are going to be blooming incredible as well um and an, and another step forwards in in knowledge and learning and appreciate and you know those guys are testing stuff so quickly so fast you know they're putting so many hours in the computer models are it, it's it's insane to see. I saw the mule sailing really briefly um, when I was in Newport not long ago. And American Magic. Yeah, American Magic. Yeah. But yeah, and wow, just nuts. Um, and, you know, a whole different dynamic with our boat when we lift the dag with the AC-50s, when we, when we lift the dagger boards, the lift doesn't change. But with those things, the dagger boards lifting up sideways, the tips changing the angle relative to the water surface. So enormous amount going on. So... And that's going to open a whole new horizons again, you know, so it's, and, and that's using flaps, not angle of attack. So there's just, yeah, the, the learning is just going to continue and continue. And it's, um, I'm sure there's going to be ride height sensors. I'm sure, you know, there'll be electronic ride height sensors guiding your foil height and, you know, people will be able to jump on a foil board and just go off and be gone. Um, and I'm sure that's the kind of place it's going to go, but. It's um yeah, a really exciting time for water sports. What about for Chris Draper? What do you you got left to achieve? It's the foiling kiting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're gonna do, be the new do, Kyle do Lenny. Do attack on the foiling kite. <laughs> I don't think I'll be going anywhere near Kyle Lenny. Um but um yeah, that's been a really cool new challenge. Um I'm looking I've got a new moth coming in a few, um, next week, which I'm really excited about. Um and then um yeah, just trying to you know, push the, the uh, push push the Great Britain Sail GP team as far as we can and you know my biggest goal to be honest is is for that team to be successful for Dylan and Stu to qualify for the games um, for us to be competitive in Marseille but for us to become commercially viable um, in the next few years you know it would be so good to be able to stand back and see we took that team from nothing and now it completely funds itself um, would be incredible. So that's that's the goal for the next um, the next yeah foreseeable future. Well, Chris, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Could could chat to you all day. It's it's been really good to catch yeah, up. Yeah, it's been cool. Thank you very much, Charles. You know, we thought that an hour was going to be tricky. <laughs> I'm sorry to keep you so long. <laughs> and best of luck in case. Thank, thank you, you very much. I hope that's whetted your appetite for the action here in Cowes this weekend. Everyone's talking about the forecast. Saturday in particular looks pretty full on. Expect drama. It's also tight at the top of the leaderboard. And with a $1 million purse at stake at the final event next month, there'll be no quarter given here in Cowes. It's going to be full on. Please let me know what you think of Chris's chat and the action this weekend. I'm easy to find at Shirley Sale on Instagram and Twitter or just me on Facebook or send an email podcast at shirleyrobertson.com. Next month, we have US sailing royalty, the one and only Paul Kayart. It's insightful in many ways. The man, the America's Cup, the Volvo Ocean Race and sailing for Disney still star sailing at a phenomenal level. Another really candid chat from a man with a ridiculous sailing CV. Until then, thank you so much for listening. Have fun on the water, even if it is at 50 knots. Sail safe, everyone. This is Cost One, Race of Speaking. Perhaps we're coming here, pressure's coming. We're 1.5 below.
Stand by, two times here, boys. We're looking at 10 5 and 42. This is Castle One standing by. Out.